Well, we are in a really, really exciting and historic season of our little life as a church. Uh, as Joanne mentioned a little bit earlier, um, we are building a new church facility for us to gather in and then to bless Kokomo from over this next year. And if you would have told me at the beginning of this church planning journey uh, just two and a half years ago that we would be, you know, breaking ground and working with architects and getting, you know, offer sheets from banks, I would have been like, ha, 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 you're nuts, right? I mean, it's, it's a crazy journey, but God, uh, in his kindness, has just been, you know, kind of blowing our minds over this last year, and we've experienced a lot of growth, not only with people coming, but with the impact that we're able to make in Kokomo and beyond, which has led us to this moment. Um, we're actually, we've grown about 40% from this time last year of people that are a part of our church. We've baptized 26 people this thus far in this year. Our kids' numbers are getting kind of like, uh, don't tell the fire marshal about Sundays kind of thing going on. And we're just so, so grateful um, for what God is doing. But the issue that we're running into is um, this old bank that we gather in. Uh, you know, we're, all, we're doing three services. We're getting jammed, especially at the 10 a.m. that you guys are all attending right now. Um, and not only that, but we found out at the end of the summer that our lease payment here is um, really being hiked to where we're going to be spending, um, I think, an unwise amount on our lease payment moving forward. Not only that, but in February of 2024, um, the owner of the building wants to sell the building. Um, and so 17 months, y'all, we homeless. Um, that's what's going on. And so that led our elders and our team to really start um, looking about what was next for us. And then in God's cosmic sense of humor, um, we were looking all over the community and right across the street was 2.8 acres and a big old parking lot. And so uh, we put an offer in on that and a really crazy thing in commercial real estate happens. Uh, we put a pretty low offer in and they accepted our first offer, uh, which was kind of nuts. And we're paying cash for that land and we are off to the races. Uh, so just to show you, here's an aerial shot of the lot that we purchased, 2.8 acres there. It was an old uh, two-story office building that got taken down by the tornado in 2016, so we're tempting fate there, you know. What could go wrong? Uh, just kidding. That's not what I believe at all. But we bought this. Here's, a, here's a, the floor plan that we're working with. We're not building a mega church. We're going to build something that's functional for us. Here's the overall floor plan, uh, auditorium, worship center, uh, a lobby, kids, and then some offices that we <laughs> desperately need as well. But I want to like zero in on a couple things we're excited about in this 16,000 square foot um, floor plan is this. Here, look at this, guys. We, that's a lobby. So like we can actually we don't have like a hallway anymore. We're gonna have a lobby with like chairs and a cafe where we can our cafe workers here are like uh, they're like, wait, are there gonna be sinks? And I tell them, yeah, there's gonna be sinks and they start crying. I don't understand that <laughs> at all. Uh, but <laughs> brewing coffee, all these different kind of crazy things. But we're gonna have a lobby space where we can actually gather in between services and you don't feel like you've got to be herded in and out like cattle. Um, so we're hoping to grow in that way. I mean, this space is gonna be similar to the whole room that you're sitting in right now. It's gonna be a lobby for us, and we're gonna have a big breakout room where we can have 20, 25 people sit in in between services where we'll do like Bridgeway 101 and different kind of things. And so we are super excited about this, but the thing I'm most excited about this week is um, our floor plan that we're working with our next gen wing. That's right, it's gonna be like a next gen wing, not just like four closet sized rooms uh, for kids. Uh, so go to that next picture. So you, you walk in directly to the left when you walk into the building, a big sign, for Bridgeway Next Gen. There's going to be a kids assembly space that's going to be large enough for 50 or 60 teenagers, elementary kids to gather in Wednesdays, Sunday nights, Sunday mornings. And we're doubling the amount of rooms that we have for our classrooms, for all of our different age appropriate ministry. Um, and we're also almost doubling the size of all of those rooms. So we'll have, you know, nursery, toddlers, preschoolers, elementary rooms for breakout into their groups. But the thing that I'm currently most excited about is that we are planning on having a sensory room to serve our families that have kids with special needs. Uh, we, um, we want to be a church that doesn't just like try to wing it to make it happen, but we want to have a special needs ministry to help um, these families, give them respite where they can come and worship and in a safe environment. Look at these kids and say that they matter to us because they matter to God and we're going to serve them in a one-on-one -on -one way in whatever capacity makes sense. Um, but we're investing in this because this is who we want to be as a community. If you've been around Bridgeway for any period of time, we are deeply concerned with the outsider. 
the people that have been left behind, the people that don't fit into the nice boxes of our society. We welcome them because we say that God welcomes them. And so we are so excited about building this into our future. I mean, the next gen at Bridgeway is a huge deal. Uh, it's not just something that we do. It's, we don't do babysitting. If you ever want to see me, like, flip out in a meeting, call what we do on Sunday mornings, child care or babysitting. No, we do age-appropriate discipleship and ministry for these little guys and girls to know that God loves them and God has a plan for them and God wants to partner with them for the remainder of their life. We actually asked some of our Bridgeway kids uh, what they love about Sundays at Bridgeway. I hope you guys enjoy this. I love Bridgeway because my teachers help me learn about God and Jesus. I love Bridgeway because I meet new people and I love the donuts. I like Sundays because I get to play with my friends. I love Sundays because of the creative games that we get to play. Learning about Jesus and doing class and coloring. I love Bridgeway because I love enjoying the stuff we do, like games and learning about Jesus and God. And I love hanging out with friends. They have lots of fun activities and the history is just fun to learn about. I like Sunday because I get donuts. I like Sunday learning and playing. I love Sundays because I get to learn about forgiveness and play with my friends. I love Bridgeway because everyone's always smiling and you get to learn new things about God. So I think we're going to keep the donuts. You guys good with that? You always ask the question, you know, if you'd start over, what would you do differently? I like to ask the question, if you start over, what would you do again? A partnership with Dan's Donuts from the very beginning. God's smile on our ministry. And a, that's the loudest amen we've ever received at this church. Uh, we got that going for us, too. But no, I love seeing their faces. And, I, you know, I, it's every now and again, if you've been here, you know, there's like, sort of a roar that comes from across the hall in our next-gen wing. And I hope you know that I'm never annoyed by that. I, I kind of get a kick out of it because it means this. It means that, like, there are kids that, like, are having fun at church. Come on, right? Like, they're, 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 getting, they're in a world that's shouting down that church matters, that God has any significance in their life. And, and we're letting them know that church is not just something for their parents, but this is for them because God wants to walk with them and partner with them in their life. And um, I love it. I love it. And that's one of the things I'm going to miss is hearing the roar in the middle of a service if they're farther away from us in the next building. Um, but, you know, you might ask the question, like, what, what's more important than the next generation? And to me, handing the gospel message of Jesus, about this King Jesus and what he's doing to put the world back together to the next generation, it means everything to me. And so we're investing heavily in it, and uh, we're investing not only for, you know, my kids, if you've got kids, but for our grandkids and for the generation to come and the generation to come after them long after I'm not in the seat at lead, as lead pastor anymore at Bridgeway. And so that's what we're inviting each and every one of us uh, to stretch for, to give towards in a powerful uh, and new way during the season. You might be asking the question, okay, how are we going to get from here to there? And we, we said it last week as we kicked off this experience together, this journey together, that it's going to take us going to new levels of our trust in God. It's going to take us in going to new levels of our surrender to God of every corner of our life. And it's going to take us going to next levels of sacrifice, actually going without something for the cause of what Jesus is up to and connecting people to him and his story. So that's what we're doing. So we've got two primary goals through this initiative uh, to grow it, it, through our generosity, through our financial sacrifice. The first goal is this, that we're, we're wanting everybody in, all in, 100% participation. Those who call Bridgeway home. Now I'm looking out and I know we've got a lot of guests 
here this morning, you know, post fall break. Please do not hear this message today like I'm trying to get into your wallets, your purses. Like that's not what we're doing here. Just I hope that um, you gain some trust from us this morning. That's what I hope. I hope you see that we're a group of people that aren't into playing church. We're not just doing this church service thing, but we're a community on mission to partner with God to bring the up there, down here, to make Kokomo look more like heaven. That's what I hope you get this morning. But for everybody else who here, who's here and you're a partner with us, you are part of the Bridgeway family, we're asking for you to go all in, 100% participation. And that means giving financially in three specific ways um, during this venture to get us to, uh, you know, shovels and dirt and us moving concrete across the street. And the first is this. We're asking everybody to give courageously financially, to look at our, our, um, our savings or our checking accounts or our investments that we can cash out and to bring um, some of those resources sacrificially to the table so that we can get this thing going. And that's a courageous ask. We're asking people to go without so that we can go forward into what God is asking us to partner with. We're asking people to give consistently. Um, every single person that's a part of Bridgeway, we're asking you to stretch that recurring giving that many of you are doing. I mean, there's over 190 families that are giving in an automated, recurring way. And I'm so grateful for that, for your faithfulness in that. But we're asking you, if you're in that, to stretch that by $25 a week or maybe double it for the next two years to get us over the hump into this new facility and into normalized expenses. Um, so we're asking everybody to do that as well. And we're also, and this is maybe my favorite part of being all in, we're asking people to give creatively. Uh, we're asking people to look at the things that they own, the things that they enjoy, the things they like, and we're literally asking you to consider selling that and bringing those resources to God for this project that we're all going all in on. And I want you to hear that me and my family, we're going to be on the front lines of this, all three. Our staff team and their families are on the front lines of this. Our board of elders and their families are on the front lines of this. Our key ministry leaders, we're all going in on this. But that's what 100% participation looks like, giving on those three levels. Uh, we're going to have a commitment Sunday on November 20th where we'll make our pledges, and then we're off to the races to make this happen. Now, that's our primary goal. Our secondary goal is maybe a little bit more daunting when you look at it on a slide, but here's our secondary goal. Um, we want to bring $1.25 million in cash to the table by March 8th, 2023. March 8th is our third birthday. March 8th is about six months from now. And it's also when we're hoping that hammers can be swinging and construction across the street could begin. $1.25 million is about a third of, it's a little over a third of the entire cost of the project. We think that'll be a great down payment to keep our monthly mortgage payments um, down low in a, way, a place where we can do it. But this is why that giving courageously thing is so important because we need everybody who calls Bridgeway home to jump in on this so that we can chip away at that and so that we can be healthy financially heading in to this build. And I know that's the scary, daunting uh, task that we have in front of us, but we are so, uh, so looking forward, so full of faith that God has called us to this project in this way that I, I, I'm excited to see how God is going to provide in it. But everybody who calls Bridgeway home, we're asking for you to go 100% in, in to help us reach this goal by March 8th of 2023. Some of us are going to give for the very first time. Some of you are going to give to a, a church, a religious institution for the very first time. Uh, some of you are going to stretch what you thought was possible to make it happen. Some of you are going to give sacrificially to go without something so that we can reach this dream together. And I'm so excited for what God's going to do. I said it this last week, and I'll say it again. Um, we're walking through this journey of faith and sacrifice and trust and surrender. And I believe in it so much that if somebody at the end of this service would walk up to me and give me a check for $1.25 million, um, I'll be honest with you, I do like the little jump in the air and kick my feet together. I'd be a little excited. That'd be my first emotion. But yes, let's see it, right? That could happen. Um, I'd probably trip and fall and it'd be a really different story. Um, but, but I would be really pumped. But we would still walk through this journey together. Because I'm so excited about what God's doing in our hearts during this season. I'm so excited about what God's going to do in us as we grow our trust. What God is going to do in us as we surrender every corner of our life to him. And what he's going to do in us as we sacrifice for a greater cause than we could ever do on our own. 
That's why we're walking through this journey together. We're calling it Bridge to the Future because God is uh, helping us get from where we are to the unknown, the future that we have in front of us. And uh, it was funny, in our table groups, um, my wife leads our couples group that meets on Monday night. We asked this question at the beginning of our gathering, uh, you know, thinking about the things that we are living in the future with today. Uh, we asked the question, what piece of technology do you have today that would just blow your six-year-old self's mind? Like you tell them about it, they're like, yeah, right. And they just had their mind completely blown. And we said you can't say smartphone because that's just too easy. And everybody would just say, oh, my phone, right? But like, think about that. What would be a piece of technology that we all have access to today that would blow the six-year-old version of yourself's mind? I mean, for me, it was really easy, really quick for me because I love love, love music. I'm a big fan of music. Um, I, I was like streaming music, like subscription services where you can stream music to where I can go to my phone and I can just like type in, um, I want the single version of Here Comes the Sun released in 1967 by the Beatles. And it's just going to be there in high fidelity. Blows my mind. Like I have access to everything. I was brought up in the generation of the CD Trapper Keeper. You know, for younger people, CDs are like you know, big iTunes or Spotify's, whatever you guys are doing today. But anyway, I had like a trapper keeper that was like this thick with all my CDs and the liner notes in it. And I would carry it around with me. I was such a dweeb, but I was like, was like the, the, the thing I was most proud of. I had all my music. I had all my Dave Matthews band records. I had all my U2 albums that I was co collecting and I was like taking it everywhere with me. And like, and the fact that like now I can just subscribe and have access to all of it blows my mind still today. So I'm sure that would blow the mind of my six-year-old self. Another person in our group said, just smart TVs and how I can say, hey, Siri, sorry, my, my phone did all, again, it just went talk off, Siri, take off. Sorry for anybody whose phone just went off. But hey, Siri, play the next episode of Bluey. And then like, you didn't even have to stand up. You didn't have to find anything. It would just play the next episode of the TV show you're pacifying your children with, right? I mean, that's a mind-blowing technology, right? Or, hey, Alexa, do this, do that. I mean, it's an amazing thing. Another crazy technology uh, that I, just blows people's minds, it blows my mind, is like the tap-to-pay feature or Apple Pay, where you don't have to bring your credit card into stores anymore, and you just, like, bring your phone up, and it magically... It's incredible, right? Until that one time that my wife asked me to go to Kroger and pick up a few things, and I arrogantly left my wallet in the car, and so I'm like, I've got like $250 of groceries, and I get up, hey, where do I tap this? And they're like, oh, we don't do that here. Kroger, you don't do that here? This is so embarrassing. So I walked out to my car. Okay, let's be honest. I kind of ran out to my car because it was so embarrassing. I had to run back and get all my groceries, and I had to actually swipe a car. But the tap to pay feature, it's pretty mind-blowing, right? I don't like thinking about it too much, but I can just pay with this phone. It's just a weird thing. But like, what are those things that, like, that you're realizing? Like, we're living in the future right here and right now. We've all got them. But I know this, that when we talk about the future, um, that's actually a, an anxiety-inducing phrase, isn't it? For us, like, thinking about the future, especially if you've got kids, you're like, oh, like what kind of world are we having our kids inherit? What kind of world is it? You know what I mean? Like, there's all this fear about what's it going to be like that creeps up. Um, the future is an anxiety-inducing thing, probably accelerated from the pandemic of thinking like, oh, are, are, am I going to be healthy? Are my kids going to be healthy? How are my parents doing? Like, how are we going to make it there, right? And, and it's a scary kind of thing, thinking about the future. And, and, you know, thinking about the economy is a scary thing. You, you better believe that in the last, uh, you know, five or six weeks as we've been preparing for this, uh, you know, this generosity initiative, of bridge to the future, I've been thinking, oh goodness, can interest rates go down? When's inflation gonna drop? Oh man, gas prices are creeping back up. All these different things where we think, will there be enough? Will there be enough not only just to give, but will there be enough for the life that I was planning on and the life that I want to hand my kids? I mean, the future can be a really scary place. And what I find fascinating is that the future being kind of anxiety inducing and a little scary, the unknown being terrifying, it's actually not a new phenomenon. <laughs> it's actually as long as there's been people, this has been a fear that we've had. And I mentioned last week that um, my, my life and my, my walk with Jesus right now is really being influenced and um, being emboldened by this ancient story of this ancient man by the name of Abram, or maybe you've heard his name, Abraham. We'll get to that in a couple weeks. But Abram was this ancient man who heard this voice <laughs> and believed that it was the voice of the creator, God, and God said, I want you to leave. Leave your father's household, your tribe, your people, your nation. Leave everything you've ever known that give you, gives you security or identity. I want you to trust me and go and scatter. And I'm going to make you a great nation. 
I'm going to give you lots of children. It's going to like populate like the stars, the amount of kids that you'll have. And then from your family, from this great nation, I'll bless the entire world. So Abram, he goes. We talked about this last week, this invitation to partner with God. Abram goes, yeah, I'm all in. This is scary, but I'm all in. And so we think about Abram's story often, and we think, man, what an example of perfect faith. Oh, look, I just, if I just had faith like Father Abraham, that many sons, like if I had that kind of faith, that would be so incredible. But what I find so comforting about the person of Abram is that he was an imperfect man with an imperfect faith, and he was following a perfect and patient God through his journey. And we see from this moment, this pivotal moment in verse 4 of chapter 12 of Genesis, where Abram goes into the unknown future that God has for him, like six verses later, we see his faith waver and his fear factor raise up through the roof. And I don't know why, but that's, that's comforting for me a little bit. But I want us to take a look at this imperfect faith of this imperfect man who is the founder of our faith, right? Let's, let's take a look at this. Just six verses after his bold faith to step out, we're told this. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. Notice that Abram's faith journey was not an up and to the right venture. It wasn't like he said yes, and then God started dropping down all these blessings into his life. He's like, I'm so glad I did this. Look at my ROI on trusting God. My return on investment is killer. This is unbelievable. We see just a few verses later, he leaves into the unknown following God, and there's a severe famine. There's no rain. There's no crops. And they're wondering where they're going to get their next meal. There's a tough circumstance that comes in to Abram's life. And I just imagine that his fear level starts bubbling up. Saying, okay, I was trusting this God, but it doesn't seem like it's working. What is going on, right? And then things just, because of that fear and him not trusting God's commitment to his promise, him trusting the story that God's going to walk with him and get him there, we see he, he makes some terrible decisions. See here, the third line down. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. So, got a plan. Say you're my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. Now, guys, you might not be the best husband, but come on. You guys see what Abram is doing here? Abram is so afraid. He's wanting to protect himself, so driven by fear and self-preservation that he's like, hey, wife, just tell everybody you're my sister, then I'm going to be good, and you'll be good, and it'll save my hide. And he's not trusting God. He's not trusting the story that God had laid out before him at all. But he sells out his wife so that he gets protected. We got to ask ourselves, like, this is just like six verses after he makes maybe the most consequential and bold decision to follow God into the unknown, to become a partner with God. I mean, this crazy decision, this is like six verses later. And it's really easy to beat up Abram, isn't it? Isn't it be like, come on, man. Like, you just left everything, and then, like, now you're not trusting God at all. You're, you're selling out your wife and telling people she's your sister. I mean, you're so afraid and not trusting God's commitment to you. Like, what are you doing, right? But let's not beat up Abram. I think we've all been there, right? We've all had a season of our life where we are gung-ho on Team Jesus, and we want to partner with him. We're, like, reading the scriptures, and we're praying. And when the songs that we sing on Sundays, they're connecting with our soul, and they're connecting us to God. And we're, like, giving with our time and our talents and our resources to the mission of God. I think we've all been there, and then something happens. There's a life circumstance that comes out of the blue, and our fear factor raises, and our trust of God's commitment to us starts to diminish, right? Maybe for you, it's, it's a relational blow up, a divorce or a breakup that just knocks you off of your equilibrium. Maybe it's a job transition that you weren't signed up for, and now you're wondering if God's going to actually provide. Maybe for you, like me, it was the timing of COVID. <laughs> and let me just be real, like, there, there was a season, uh, there was probably a couple weeks to a month where, like, right when we started the church, my faith was like, what had I done? I mean, some of you don't know this, but like we had our grand opening here in this space on March 8th of 2020, and we had given and sacrificed and raised about $100,000 just to get some lights and some drums to make this thing happen, and people had all given, 
to make it happen. We had our grand opening. There were over 300 people here. We baptized four people that had joined us on our launch team and found Christ through that process. We had to order 60 more chairs on Monday because we're like, oh, man, we, we don't have the volunteers to do three services yet. What are we doing? Like, this is a crazy kind of thing. And then I was sitting back in the production booth putting in my slides for my second sermon ever at Bridgeway, and I get this alert on my phone. And then I get another alert on my phone. It was March 12, 2020, that they canceled um, March Madness. <laughs> they canceled the NBA season. Then an alert from Governor Holcomb that we weren't allowed to have gatherings with more than 10 people in a room after we just invested $100,000 into the space. I wasn't taking a salary yet from the church. I was leaning on my sugar mama to make things happen at home. <laughs> And I, I just, like, I didn't know what to say. I was, like, shell-shocked. I'm like, is this real? Is this just going to be something that's going to be a week? Like, what do we do? We have no cameras. I mean, what just happened? We had one Sunday service. So I went home, and literally I got in the shower, and I just cried for, like, an hour, ran out of hot water. Because <laughs> I was like, God, what have I gotten myself into? God, where are you in this situation? God, this is not what I signed up for. God, we just had this incredible experience. What's going on here? And my fear rose and my trust in what God had promised to do diminished, diminished, and diminished. So I've been there. I don't want to beat up Abram too much. But what I love about Abram, again, is that he's this guy, an imperfect guy with an imperfect faith, but he's on a journey of trusting this perfect and patient God with his future. Because this isn't the first time that we see Abram mess up. And we see Abram in different ways just forget to trust God and have his trust diminish. In Genesis chapter 16, Abram was impatient that God hadn't given him a child yet because he's getting up there in age. So he sleeps with his handmaiden and has a child that way. He doesn't trust that God's going to provide. Genesis chapter 17, God says again, I'm going to provide you an heir for this kingdom, that, in this nation that's going to be great. And God la or Abram laughs at God's face, saying, there's no way, I'm too old and you haven't come through on your promise. Genesis chapter 20, he like goes on repeat and he lies again about Sarai, saying that this is my sister again. It's like, it's weird when you're reading Genesis, you're like, again, did he not catch the notion the first time that wasn't a good move? I mean, he's this imperfect guy. But God takes him on a journey of his faith growing and being stretched and being tested. My friends, as, as we're stepping into this journey of sacrifice, <laughs> of the unknown, of us all pulling together to make this new facility happen so we can gather in and we can bless Kokomo from it. Um, it's going to be a journey of ups and downs. And what God shows Abram is what I hope he shows us is that he is committed to us. <laughs> and he'll use these situations to stretch our faith and to grow our faith. So let's look at a couple lessons from Abram's story. The first is this. That our faith grows by stretching it. This is a principle that your faith is not just what you believe or what you were handed in Sunday school as kids. That's not what your faith is. Your faith is also not the warm fuzzies that you might feel when bad things happen, that everything's going to be all right because Jesus loves me. Your faith is a trust in this unshakable God who is on movement in the world to put the world back together. And he's invited you to be a part of his family, a part of his mission. And so your faith is your trust in God and what he is doing. And our faith grows by stretching it. Abram says yes in chapter 12, verse 4. Chapter 12, verse 10, there's a great famine that stretched his understanding of what God was doing. Because he's like, this is a terrible circumstance. There's no way that this is actually God's plan. Maybe God has ejected me from his plan. Maybe I messed up or maybe this God is not trustworthy. But you see here that faith is not a one-time decision. Faith is not raising your hand in a church service. Faith is not walking an aisle. Faith is a posture of saying, God, I trust you right here, right now. And then the next day, God, I trust you right here, right now. God, I trust you that you are good and you made me good and you're going to walk with me. And don't let me look back on my brokenness or not trust your goodness. It's a decision, a posture every single day. And our faith grows by stretching it. Think of it this way. Faith is like a muscle, Right? If you've ever had a long period of time where you've not exercised or worked out or lifted weights, and then you go back that first time and you like do five curls or something like that, uh, you walk up, you wake up the next morning and you're like, I'm dead, right? <laughs> like I, I am hurting in places I didn't know I could hurt. Um, but the reality is that uh, our faith is much like a muscle, right? That um, 
muscles, they hurt that next day because they have like thousands of these micro tears. And your body is sending signals to that place of your body to say it needs to grow back. We need to send more energy, more protein so that it stretches, it grows, and it heals, and it comes back bigger and stronger. Same thing as with our faith, you guys. While it's stretched, it grows, and it comes back bigger and stronger because of the way that God shows up. God uses the stretching moments in our life to grow our faith. But also, God shows us in those stretching moments that we're working on his clock and not our clock. I mean, God, Abram experienced this as well because God promised Abram he was going to give him a great family and build a great nation from him. Uh, but that was when he was 75 years old, which would have been hard enough to believe at 75. But we're told 25 years pass, and God still had not dropped a child down for him. He didn't bring the stork thing happening. He didn't make it happen. So whether you believe that those numbers are actually quantitative and that's literally what happened, or you think that the author's intent was to show you this dude was old. This was not supposed to happen. You're okay. You know, I mean, you can see those things differently. But this was not supposed to happen, and God worked on his timing for this to happen. It's almost like God said, Abram, you know, you need to feel helpless. You need to feel dependent on me to trust me in this moment. Don't push eject, but trust me in this moment. Just for, just for a minute, let's fast forward thousands of years to the brother of Jesus, a guy by the name of James, who's writing to the early church, early gatherings of Jesus followers. And he says this about how um, you know, hard times they do something inside of our faith and our trust of God. I love what Jesus' brother James says. He says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. As your faith is stretched through hard circumstances, as your faith is stretched what you believe to be actually possible, God does something. He produces something. James calls it perseverance. I call it like a doggedness. I like to think of it as grit, that this is not a faith that's fluffy. This is not a faith that just feels good when things are good. No, this is a gritty faith that no matter what comes before me, I'm trusting that God has not dropped me and that God is someone who's telling the story and I can trust that story. I can take it to the bank. James continues and says, let perseverance, that grittiness, finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. In other words, let that gritty nature of your faith, don't push eject, don't quit early, hang in there because God does something in the stretching and the breaking and the stress on our lives that we'll miss if we just push eject and be like, eh, not this time, economy's bad. Not this time, well, I just don't know what's going on with my job. Not this time because I mean, we got a mess in our family right now. All those different kind of things that go on. James is saying, God grows our faith by stretching it. He produces something beautiful in us while we hang in there and we trust him through. This is what Abram experienced. And my friends, as we are like on the precipice, it's just week two of this journey, a bridge to the future. This is what I want to encourage us and challenge us to step into. That yes, it's going to be a bit scary. Yes, it's going to be a stretch. Yes, it's going to be beyond what we've ever done before. But still take the step into the darkness. You know, one of my personal, like, struggles, can I just, like, reverse pastor for a minute here, um, confess to y'all, um, about, like, sort of in my journey with Jesus right now, what's hard for me is that I just want to know how it's all going to play out. Like, I want to know how much money is going to be there on March 8th. I want to know what con general contractor we're going with. I want to know what bank and what interest rate and the amortization of our mortgage and what we're going to have to pay each month. I want to know it all. Like, I'm like, God, you're going to do it. Just tell me all the details, right? But it, the thing that's, like, God's showing me is that he just gives me enough light for one next step at a time. He doesn't give you the 10-year plan. He doesn't give you the five-year plan. He's not giving me all the details about the next six months, two years, but he just gives us enough light for the next right step. And that's just doing something in me right now because I'm having to take those steps and every step, I'm seeing God show up. I'm seeing God's faithfulness. I'm seeing what he is doing. My friends, if you are in a season, hear me, and don't think about bridge the future, money, all these kind of sacrifice things that we're talking about. But if you are in a season where you feel like you're in the middle of a storm, where you're in the middle of a valley, where you feel like uh, God has not shown up, and so you're starting to doubt his character, his goodness, his promise, his commitment to you, I want you to hear this. This is the character of God. This is what we've seen revealed through the scriptures, exemplified perfectly through Jesus, and that I'm banking my life on, and I'm encouraging you to do the same thing. Let's put it this way. God is rarely early. 
never late, but always on time. He's rarely early. He's not going to show you the whole plan and how it's going to play out, but he is never late. He will never leave you nor forsake you as you stretch out to partner with him and trust him. He's always right on time. So if you're struggling today, if you feel like God is distant from you today, if you're waiting on a sign and it feels like you're waiting 25, 50 years, man, trust the character of this God because he'll use it to stretch you, to grow you. But it's only in that that you become mature and complete, the person that God has created you to ultimately be, a fully flourishing human being. Another thing that I think we can learn from Abram's uh, faith journey as a challenge to us as we're thinking about becoming people of sacrifice and surrender is, is this about God's commitment. Our faith grows when we trust God's commitment to us. Our faith grows when we trust that God has our best in mind even if we don't see it. Let me say it this way. God is more committed to your flourishing as a human being and as a partner with him than you are. God is more committed to this church than I am. God is more committed to your family than you are. God's commitment is something that we can always take to the bank. I don't have enough time to walk through this verse by verse, but there's this powerful thing that happens in Abram's story in Genesis chapter 15. Uh, Abram is getting like, you know, he's kind of getting like, mm, come on, God, show me something. Give me something here. You keep telling me you're going to give me a kid and we're going to become a great nation. You keep telling me I'm going to have land. Nothing's happened yet. And so he's getting a little you know, with, with God. Uh, and, and, and I love that God receives that and God like, gives him something back. He says, I want you to trust me, but I'm not asking for blind faith here. So God says, hey, I want you to go get some animals and uh, we'll take it from there. And Abram picked up immediately what God was wanting because he was setting up what's called in the ancient world a blood path covenant to where there would be like animals cut in half on both sides so that they could have a contract deal between two parties of people. It was actually an ancient betrothal or engagement ceremony. So Abram gets these animals and he like chops them in half on both sides and all the blood is pooling in the middle so that they would walk through. Sidebar. Aren't you glad that when we buy things now, you decide to sign your name a million times? But this is what the ancient world was doing. This is what God was meeting people in the middle of. And so Abram does this, but then he gets cold feet right before he does this because he's like, the, the, the purpose of this covenant was that if somebody fails to come through on their side of the deal, then they would have to give their life. And Abram realizes that he's making this deal with the God of the universe, and so he gets cold feet. He falls asleep. He must be an Enneagram 9 to where they just fall asleep instead of dealing with conflict. Um, sidebar for six or seven of you know what that is. Um, but he falls asleep. He wakes up, and he sees this vision of this uh, fiery, like, smoky pot, wa like, floating through both sides, and he sees this, uh, this flame going through as well. We're like, what in the heck are you talking about, Joel? What is actually going on? But this is actually throughout the scriptures how God in his presence is shown in the Old Testament was through smoke and through fire. And there are two manifestations of God's presence to walk through this blood path. And Abram doesn't walk through at all. What is this showing us? This is showing us this irrevocable, one-sided covenant, commitment from God to Abram. Abram was too chicken. He didn't walk through. But here is God saying that I'm going to walk through and I'm going to promise my end of the deal to partner with you, Abram. And you know what? Even if you fail, I'm going to walk through on your behalf and I will provide the sacrifice. I'll take the L. I will give my life if you can't follow your end of the deal. Now, if you're a Christian, all of the lights on your dashboard, all your Jesus lights should be going off everywhere, right? Because this is what Jesus did for us when we couldn't live up to our part of the deal. Jesus, in his mercy and his grace, points us back to his goodness and says that we belong. And he dies a death that he didn't deserve at all to show us the love that we needed to see and to absolve, of, absolve us of our guilty conscience of our sin to just stare at Jesus and partner with him. All that being said, for the six or seven of you that like that kind of cultural thing is that God is more committed to us than we are. We can trust him. We, when we partner with him, you guys, God is going to come through. He is committed to his partners. This began with Abram. It went to his family and to the nation of Israel. And from the nation of Israel, Jesus comes. And all of our stories are intersected with the God of the universe because of Jesus. In the same way, you guys, as we stand at the precipice, the beginning of this faith journey of 
building a bridge to the future for us, God is giving us an opportunity to partner with him as well. He's saying, become a person of sacrifice, become a person of greater stretched trust, become a person of surrender, and then your kids and the next generation, and long after I'm not in the seat of being lead pastor here, there's going to be an outpost of God's kingdom on earth in Kokomo, Indiana, welcoming people with open arms to experience life in him. What an invitation. What an invitation. There's this prayer that we're asking you to pray throughout this season. And it's a dangerous prayer. It's a bold prayer. But here's the prayer I want us, if you're a follower of Jesus and if you're a part of our family here at Bridgeway, to be praying this as we head into this season. God, what do you want to do through my sacrifice to build a bridge to the future? God, what do you want to do through my sacrifice? You know what my sacrifice entails? It, it, it entails us stretching. It entails our faith being stretched beyond what we've done previous, but it's sacrifice. It's going without so that God's mission can move forward. God, what do you want to do through the wealth, through the resources, through what you've given me and my family so that we can be a part of this future that you're calling us to? Man, it's a beautiful and dangerous prayer. But it's going to stretch our faith. It's going to grow us. It's going to give us perseverance and grittiness. And that's a promise because God is more committed to my flourishing and to his mission than I could ever possibly be. And we get to be on the other side of it someday and be like, hey, we were a part of this. And that's an exciting, exciting thing to consider for the future. So everybody has um, in the seat backs in front of you or behind you, we have these commitment cards. I want to just point your attention to for the next couple minutes. If you weren't here last week, take one with you, take a look at it. But in the seat back in front of you or behind you, we have these commitment cards. And I just want to point our attention to how we're actually going to get there, like be as direct as possible about the way that my family is walking through this and how we're inviting everybody to walk through this together. The first part of the card is this, and this is really important, this is of utmost importance here, is that one-time gift from our savings, from accumulated resources, from our checking account. Um, and we're asking for these resources to come in by our third birthday, March 8th, 2023. Um, so that way we can hopefully get hammer swing in in the next week or so after that this spring. But this is important because this is where the $1.25 million is really going to come from. I mean, we're excited for that stretch recurring giving and what it's going to do, but this is where that down payment is going to come from. So we're asking everybody to play at some level. Now hear me, this is we're asking for equal sacrifice, not equal amounts of resources. We know every family is in a different place. We're just asking you to consider what does sacrifice look like for you? What does courageous generosity look like for you and your family? That might be $200. That might be $200,000. It's different for each and every one of us. But this is what we're asking you to consider. That second piece of this card is the stretch recurring gift where we're asking you to like help us lift our financial um, lid over the next two years for those expenses that are going to come. And I, it's current, I'm sure we'll have to pay more than what our lease payment is here on a mortgage. So we're like looking at that. We're asking everybody to be all in to give in that way. And then the third, the thing I'm most excited about is that creative giving, that non-cash gift that you'll see on the commitment card. Uh, people to sell a boat or a car or <coughs> electric guitars. <coughs> might be happening in my house. Um, all those different kind of things that we're all going to jump in on. And we're asking everybody to look, ha ask God to give you eyes to see those things that you can sacrifice so that we can get there. The last chart I want to show you is this, this giving chart that we're showing to, to let you know that we really need everybody all in. Everybody who calls Bridgeway home to play a part of this journey. And I'm very careful that this is a giving triangle, not a giving pyramid. We stay away from pyramids, right, in these things, right? <laughs> But in this giving chart, you see uh, the list on the right side. You see how many gifts, how many different families we're going to need to play in this. And it's over 120 different families that we're asking to play in this journey for us to reach our $1.25 million goal. Gifts like $1,000, 35 people. Gifts like $10,000, six families to jump in on that. All the way at the top, you see $80,000 and $150,000. But it's going to take us all to ask God, what do you want to do through my, my life and through these resources? What do you want me to postpone for this opportunity that we have in front of us to make a difference for my generation and the generation to come? Um, our band's going to lead us in a song as we close today. And I want to invite you guys to stand up. Stand up with me, please. We're going to sing this song. And the song is called Available. And it, it's, a, it's a dangerous prayer for us to pray these words, you guys. I'll be real with you. But over and over in the song, it says, I hear when you call, and I am available. 
And this is, this is why I'm so, you know, doggedly re- determined for us to walk through this journey together because no matter what the resources, the money side looks like, I want to be a part of a faith community and I want to lead a faith community that doesn't play church, but we take it seriously and we put our money where our mouth is when it comes to us wanting to reach our community with the love and the hope of Jesus. So here's the deal as we sing this song. If you're comfortable, I'm going to ask you guys to put your hands out just like this. I'm not asking anybody to go full like that. Put your hands out like this. And just in a symbol of open hands, saying, God, I want to be available for what you want to do through me and my family during this season. God, I want to be available to partner with you and however you might call me to during this season. So if you're comfortable, during this song, sing the words, read the words, pray these words with your hands out like this, just as this posture of openness to what God might be calling us into as Katie leads us. Let's sing this together.